Hello, y'all. Uh, thanks for coming to see me and welcome to the history of CICD. First, a little bit about myself. Like Maddie said, my name is Kat Cosgrove, and that is my cat, Espresso. I am a staff developer advocate at Plumy. I didn't really get where I am through strictly traditional means. Um, I was a freelance web developer for a few years, and then I was an embedded Linux engineer, which was kind of a weird detour. But I've also been a bartender and a waiter, a teacher, and the resident horror expert at an independent video store, which is why my little intro thing uh, is, is horror themed. Also, happy October. I hope you're watching horror movies this month, if that's what you're into. If you have questions about those, feel free to ask me as well. But uh, I credit a lot of my success as an engineer and now as a developer advocate to the way I got where I am. It's allowed me to see the tech industry from a lot of different angles and to have a lot of different struggles. Some of these struggles are still fairly universal, like just everybody runs into these problems and they're largely unaddressed. Even people already working in the industry, like a lot of y'all, may not have all of the historical context that's necessary to really understand the scale of what a particular tool does for us. So I give talks like this one to try to solve that. If you want to get a hold of me later, you can find me on Twitter at Dixie3Flatline. Uh, most of the tweets are actually written by my cat, but she's really cute, so it's okay. Uh, I'm always happy to help you if it's within my power. So please don't hesitate to reach out if you need something. If you DM me, just make sure you include the question in your actual initial DM. I don't respond to ones that just say hi uh, for reasons. But let's get in there. So we have a lot of jargon in cloud technology, and especially we have a lot of it in DevOps. And some of these concepts are relatively new, so it's understandable that we don't really have a good grasp on what they are. Um, the definitions kind of do change over time, but some of them are really old and the definitions have changed so radically that it can be kind of hard to pin down what the actual origin is. So like, what does DevOps really mean? Is this a methodology or is it a tool set? People are still giving entire conference talks on that exact question. Is any of this actually going to make my life easier or is it just a bunch of industry buzzwords? We've also got entire conference talks on that. Like, these are questions that are genuinely sometimes still pretty hard to answer. And when it comes to specific tooling, a lot of the documentation we have assumes that you already have a bunch of context or that you're proficient in some related tooling or like the, the precursor to this tool. And that doesn't really make it easy to learn things. So today, I'm going to give you the history and the context surrounding one of the most important pieces of the DevOps puzzle, or pie, depends on how food motivated you are, I'm very food motivated, CICD. So what does that actually stand for? If you work in DevOps already, and for a lot of you, this is a DevOps conference, I assume you do, uh, this, this could seem obvious. I, I promise you that for a lot of people, it's not. The CI stands for continuous integration, and the CD can stand for either continuous delivery or continuous deployment. They do mean different things. And I know that sounds like it's already confusing and complicated, but I promise I'll define them both. Uh, it is a little bit ridiculous, though. We will start with continuous integration. That means merging all of the developer's working code base with the source multiple times a day. Doing it requires a series of automated build and unit tests and on and on and on to ensure that none of the proposed changes cause problems. But the result is that bugs and integration issues are discovered much, much earlier in the development process. Ideally, a build is triggered with every single commit. 
So a failure would be caught by the developer immediately and then corrected immediately. Or, well, I say immediately. It depends on how long it takes your build to run, but you get the point. It doesn't take like, you know, days. It also forces engineers to write code that's more modular, which makes it easier to support later on because ultimately like the computer is executing your code, but like people have to maintain and extend it. So it's important to not try to get like too cute. Nobody actually appreciates that. And con continuous integration has actually been a thing for a long time. It's been around since like the early nineties, but it hasn't always been called that. And some of the implementation has changed. However, the spirit has remained the same. We merge changes into source in smaller but way more frequent increments, test that the project still builds and it runs with those changes, and we make sure that your engineers are all working from the most recent version of the source. If we do this, we won't end up with a ton of merge conflicts or surprise problems when it comes time to build. When I say it was old, I mean, it's, it's almost as old as me. Uh, it was first proposed by a man named Grady Booch in 1991 in his book, Object Oriented Analysis and Design with Applications. The Booch method advocated for more frequent use of classes and objects in programming in order to simplify design. His version of continuous integration didn't suggest releasing multiple times a day though. In 1997, we got extreme programming and it built on the Booch method by advocating for releasing multiple times a day. Uh, this kind of changed the game, honestly. And um, I know the name sounds ridiculous, uh, but it didn't sound ridiculous at the time. It sounds, it sounds ridiculous in the year of our Lord 2021, but back then it, it didn't mean extreme in like, a 90s X Games edgy product marketing, Alienware computers kind of way. It meant taking concepts and paradigms that were already standard accepted parts of writing and releasing software, and then taking those concepts like way further, like doing it to the extreme, the most extreme implementation of a concept that we could imagine at the time. That's what extreme programming was named for. So um, it's not doing like sick kick flips or whatever. Um, though it would be cool, but it's not. So thanks to extreme programming, uh, we now have shorter release cycles. Uh, we have more extensive code review in the form of pair programming, unit testing, acceptance testing. All of these are standard aspects of writing software now because of extreme programming. They all make our lives easier and they radically improve quality. More and more methodologies built on the work of their predecessors from Scrum to Kanban, all with one goal in mind, make it easier to write clearer, higher quality code and get it out to the users faster. In the early days, while we recognized that we needed to be releasing more often, we didn't really have the tools to make that happen, at least not easily. We didn't get the first open source tool to make continuous integration easier to achieve until 2001 with the release of cruise control. If you go like do a Google image search for cruise control, it looks pretty primitive now, but at the time it was a game changer. This is not the actual logo for cruise control. Um, I just couldn't find a version of their logo with a transparent background. And um, I was too lazy to um, just grab it and strip it out in Photoshop myself. Uh, there isn't one with a transparent background, fun side story, because the PNG image format uh, wasn't widely supported by browsers until Internet Explorer 9, which was released in 2011 one year after the last update to cruise control. That's how old it is. And people are still using it. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> cruise control was revolutionary at the time of its release. For the first time, we had a system we could install and stand up ourselves to automate the management of builds, which allowed us to release way more of them. It even integrated with your IDE if you were using Eclipse. 
cruise control was Java specific. So if you were writing like Ruby, you had to use the Ruby variant of cruise control. And there were a few of these. Eventually it was overtaken by Jenkins, which is still like very widely in use today. It supports a ton of different languages. It can be made to do almost anything you want. And it has an enormous community around it. So when you do run into difficulties, it's almost certain that someone else has run into it before and they've documented it for you. So that's like, that's really cool and convenient. It's the, the upside of using something that's been around for an eternity, not a literal eternity, but it's starting to feel like it, you know, a long time in internet years. It's stable, it's pretty secure, and it's very popular. However, the way we build software is changing, has changed quite a lot. The way we deploy software is changing. The way we use software is changing. And Jenkins is kind of starting to show its age a bit. You have to stand up the infrastructure and install it yourself. And somebody has to be responsible for maintaining it. This is also true to an extent with Jenkins X, their newer cloud native offering, though the requirements of you as far as like maintenance and actual infra are uh, considerably lower. Enter the cloud. Rapidly, self-hosted, self-managed CI tools like Jenkins or the now defunct, although people are still using it, please stop using it, please, I'm begging you are being replaced by cloud services that you don't have to babysit, like CircleCI and GitHub Actions. They support dozens of different languages and build environments. They already know how to deal with cloud native technologies like Docker and Kubernetes. They integrate directly with a wealth of other services to handle deployments or analytics or observability. It's both more flexible and lower maintenance, but you do lose some security by not being 100% in control of your CI system. Now, that's like, that's an argument we could have. Uh, there's probably a whole conference talk in there about like whether uh, a self-managed solution is more secure than a hosted solution for CI. Um, I I can see it both ways. People are a vulnerability. Um, so we could, we could have a whole long argument about this, but at surface level, you lose some control. So assuming that your infrastructure team is perfect and so is your security team, then maybe self-managed is safer, whatever. For most people, this is an acceptable trade-off. Uh, I personally am really, really lazy. That's the first time I'm going to say this in this talk, I will say it again. Uh, so I, I always go with the cloud solution myself, but that's just CI. We got to talk about the CDs, like this CD, not like the way I used to listen to music when I was a kid. So the first one, continuous delivery means exactly what it says on the box. Your software updates get continuously delivered not deployed, delivered. In concert with continuous integration, this means that you should have the ability to deploy a new build very quickly because you've already automated some quality gates that would otherwise need to be performed manually, like building or testing or whatever. That reduction in manual labor means you get to release a bunch of much smaller changes rather than one huge update every couple of months. Since you're now making smaller, more incremental changes, you can also be more confident that your release isn't going to break when you deploy to your users, or that if it does break, because you're, you're never going to have a career, nobody's ever going to have a career where they never like push a bad update. It's just not going to happen. If your update is smaller, it's going to be easier to track down what caused it and also easier to roll it back. Continuous deployment is similar, but it goes one step further. Deployment gets automated too. 
In continuous delivery, there is still a manual quality gate involved before an update is out in the wild. This is a controversial step for some people. It requires a lot of trust in your system, but I am a huge fan of it. For your DevOps pipeline, and thus you, to be as efficient as possible, we have to remove human involvement wherever we can. I say this a lot. It's another thing I will say more than once in this talk, but we are really bad at repetitive tasks. We get bored, we get distracted, and we're really slow. So write good, comprehensive tests and automate everything you can, and then accept that you absolutely are going to deploy a bad update eventually, whether a human is involved in clicking the big green button or not. Having a human push that button is not security. It, it is a security blanket. It's, it's not real reliability. What matters here is how quickly you can respond to and correct a bad update. Both continuous delivery and continuous deployment help you get there, but personally, I automate away pushing the green button. So high level CICD is just a term for the marriage of these concepts. It's an important part of DevOps since automation and efficiency is what we are all here for. And one doesn't really work in the context of DevOps without the other. Implementing CI/CD practices gets you a faster, more reliable release cycle. You can add new features or bug fixes pretty quickly since your engineers are all working from the most recent version of source. You know there are unit and integrations tests and you know it builds. There aren't a bunch of manual steps involved for the engineers or QA or whoever else you might have managing your quality gates. Instead, somebody pushes code or opens PR and those steps are taken care of. You don't have to think about it. No thoughts, head empty, push code. To start, you need a CI CD tool, okay? So this is what's going to be uh, automating a bunch of manual processes for you. It takes some time to set up at the start of a new project, but personally, again, I'm really lazy and I'm the flavor of lazy where I'm willing to spend a ton of extra time at the beginning to make sure that I don't have to do the same thing over and over again. I love it. The specifics of configuring any of these varies. So, you know, check the docs for your chosen tool. Um, also shout out to technical writers, you're not paid enough. But broadly, they all pretty much work the same way. You set something as a trigger, telling it to watch your source repository for a commit or a merge. And then you configure a bunch of steps, each with some pass fail condition, like how to run your unit tests, how to stand up your infrastructure, Build, scan for vulnerabilities, or deploy if you're, you know, feeling saucy. With a sufficiently detailed CI CD pipeline, you really don't have to do anything. You just write code and you push it and everything else is done. It's pretty rad. So now that we know what CI CD is, Let's talk about what goes into an update and why it's important, I guess. So if you're around my age or older, you probably remember how much drama used to be involved in software updates. Uh, they were big, they were infrequent, they took a lot of time to apply, and the change logs were huge. There was a pretty significant chance that the new version would be buggy in some way, and it was just generally an inconvenient experience. If you're younger than me, this might sound wild now, but it used to be totally normal to be expected to go like a year without seeing a software update, sometimes longer. It just blows my mind. Regardless of your age, can you imagine waiting that long for an update today? A bunch of you are developers. Can you imagine waiting that long to release? I can't eat anymore. Like, no, I lived through it and I can't. In a lot of situations, it wasn't even possible to just download an update, okay? Like the manufacturer would have to provide you with the update via some kind of like physical media, whether it meant like a floppy disk or CD-ROMs or a USB drive. The last time I had to do this was not that long ago, actually. It was in 2009. I was updating the software for the video store I worked at. 
In 2009, the vendor had to snail mail me a thumb drive. They would not just email me the executable. I asked, they wouldn't do it. To be fair, this particular application still required a machine with a serial port because license authentication was performed by verifying the presence of a physical dongle that only connected via serial. Uh, some things do still work this way, but it's really, really, really rare outside of a small handful of industries that are like exceedingly security conscious. Phones have suffered a similar problem with the CD side of things. Way back in the 90s, uh, there wasn't really a way to update software on your phone, right? If you wanted like Snake, you had to buy a new phone. Eventually, phones did get smarter, obviously, but updates still required plugging the phone into a computer and cloud storage wasn't ubiquitous yet. So data transfers when you upgrade to a new phone were done also by a physical cable. Uh, it's been a while since I've had to do this. I think the last time was like six years ago when I switched uh, to a Pixel. And now it's something that we don't even think about. You switch phones, all your contacts and photos and apps and whatever else are just there. There's some setup time, but it happens pretty seamlessly. You don't have to be involved. So we've gotten much better at this over time in large part due to the prevalence of cloud computing and CD getting better, but we're still not perfect. So I'm going to try not to end this on a horror story, even though it is the month of October, but let's look at a couple of real world examples of situations where a CICD could have prevented a problem. First, we're going to talk about money. It turns out that not updating frequently and automatically can actually be like crazy expensive, like company shutteringly expensive. In 2012, a bad software update caused a major stock market disruption and tanked the value of a company called Knight Capital. They were a trading firm that specialized in automated transactions on the New York Stock Exchange. And one day, it all came crashing down. You see, they weren't automating their updates or their deployments. And they weren't updating all that often either. And remember, humans are bad at repetitive tasks. We're especially bad at them when we don't get a lot of practice. Two things contributed to this disaster. One, when the engineer was updating the eight servers responsible for handling these automated trades, he forgot one. Only seven of the eight had the new software. They also reused an API endpoint and changed the behavior in the new version. You can probably see where this is headed. When it went into prod, it was chaos. Requests to the old server running the old API endpoint wreaked havoc on the share prices of 148 companies. Engineers responded by taking the seven updated machines offline to roll back, increasing the load on the one machine that was never updated to begin with. There was no logging, there was no monitoring, and they had no alerts. They had to sit there trying to figure out what happened, losing money the whole time. In the 45 minutes this bad update was live, Knight Capital lost $440 million and ultimately went out of business as a result. Those servers were all being updated manually, but humans get tired, we get bored, we get distracted, we just have bad days and aren't perfect. It's normal. It's not that guy's fault. If the process had been automated, this might not have happened. But for me, the most compelling argument is the security angle. This is a story you have probably heard before. Well, I mean, you probably, you probably lived through it, actually, because... Uh, it was a lot of people, but you might not be aware of exactly how this happened and how bad it was. So in September of 2017, Equifax announced that a serious breach had occurred between May and July of that year. This is like all we heard about for months. But remember the first month, May, the names, addresses, driver's license numbers, social numbers of just short of 149 million Americans had been stolen. 
The hackers had exploited CVE 2017-5638, which was a vulnerability in a very commonly used web framework called Apache Struts. Talking about how this exploit actually works is way out of scope for this talk, but the gist is that it would allow an attacker to remotely execute commands with whatever authority the web server had. This was not a vulnerability that flew under the radar, to be clear. Even before the breach, the CVE was a big deal. It was classed as a critical vulnerability, something that absolutely had to be taken seriously and corrected immediately. It really, nobody would shut up about this at the time. This was also published and disclosed in March, months before Equifax was breached. Once they discovered the breach, it took them two full months to find and upgrade usages of the vulnerable version of struts. Hackers had remained in the system undetected for months at that point. Lawsuits were filed, resulting in a $575 million settlement with the FTC, as well as payments and credit monitoring for those affected. Unfortunately for most of us, the number of people affected by the breach was so large that after attorney's fees, most of us got nothing but a lifetime of being paranoid about their credit. So this was caused by a lack of vulnerability detection, but it was exacerbated by an inability to update quickly. This is exactly the kind of thing that a robust CICD system is there to help mitigate. But I don't want to end this on a horror story because that's mean. So we'll, we'll do a little bit of a recap first. So CICD is a combination methodology and tooling, in my opinion, with the goal of increasing your speed and efficiency as a developer by automating tasks that are manual and boring and we don't like doing. The benefit is we all get software updates more often. We get to push them. Users get to use them. We get catch bugs more quickly and bad releases don't make it to prod as often. It's been around for a long time, longer than we like to think since DevOps feels so new. DevOps is barely a decade old as a term. So we tend to think of the pieces that make up DevOps as being equally as young, but CICD is pretty old and it's changed a lot over the years. It's become much more useful and much more accessible. It's a tool used across industries to make things easier than they were for me and for you and for our users. I hope I've helped you understand what CICD is and where it came from and what it does for you and how it's changed since Booch first coined the term. Uh, feel free to get in touch with me on Twitter at Dixie3Flatline, or you can email me at cat at palumi.com, but I will warn you that I am not great at responding to emails with like any level of urgency. Thank you. Thanks, Kat. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes for a little segment that I like to call Devo Ops. And I just oh, wanted should to I get ask my you hat? a couple of questions. Maybe, maybe, if we really want to do this right. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the first sort of thought I had and about why like a talk like this is important um, from a history perspective is I've been thinking kind of all day about this idea of the LCD sound system song, uh, Losing My Edge, and how that's a okay. little bit like this, right? It's like, hey, I was there. I was there, and I went and told Andrew Clay Schaefer, don't call it ops dev, call it DevOps. But <laughs> it's not just about, like, hipsterism, right? Like, we, there's reasons uh, that we've implemented things the way that we have, and things have even changed. Um, yeah. So I, I wanted to kind of ask... You and I have talked about this a little bit before about, you know, why continuous delivery, which doesn't have the deployment part automated, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense today because you're like, it's, and, and I, I think it's a lot of it was because it's like making the deployment a business decision, which sounds wacky in a world where we have feature flags. So I don't know yeah, I mean, what, what kind of, yeah. I agree with you. Feature flags, y'all. You can unshare your yeah. screen, Kat. Ooh, cool. So you, the Y'all can actually yeah. see me? Yes. Uh, then people will get the, the gag that we worked so hard on by not preparing for it all. <laughs> <laughs> we did work very hard on this. Yeah, I agree. Feature flags, y'all. We have them. Love them. Please. Please. Like, it's it, it really is 
it's a safety blanket, the the not automating the deployment bit. I, I don't understand it. Um, I, I guess it's it's a piece of anxiety that we we collectively cannot seem to get over, but we we need to get over it because it's just just why. Why are you a human who gets tired and bored and makes mistakes and has bad days better at determining whether or not a build should be deployed than the computer, which doesn't get tired or bored or have bad days? You know, it's it's exactly as smart as it was when you told it what to do. And you have the time to iterate on telling it how to be more perfect. but you you can't really do that for yourself you can't prevent a bad day so just just deploy it it's the what devo would do thing, it is what devo would do devo knows you can't prevent a bad day but what you can do with that bad day is you can whip it you can whip you it can good you can whip it good yeah absolutely uh so cat thanks for thanks for taking us down memory lane I think you and I need to work on maybe another talk where we uh, talk about losing my edge from the DevOps perspective. But uh, let's do it. Thank you. Thank you for some DevOps.